In your book, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, you talked about the bombing patterns during the Second World War and the fact that it was amazing that there were certain factories that were not bombed, whereas the majority of the German factories were decimated, German-owned factories. There were certain factories that tied into this interlock we've already alluded to mm -hmm. that, for some strange reason, seemed to escape the devastation of our saturation bombing. In, in World War II, the uh, German uh, electrical industry was or should have been a prime target for Western bombing. But in practice, uh, the German General Electric plants were not bombed. Uh, of the ten major plants, not one was bombed, and a half a dozen others had trifling damage, broken windows, that kind of thing. So what we have here is a very interesting case of an industry which should have been bombed in World War II but was not bombed, and yet we have a market ownership, which raises a certain amount of suspicion as to why it was not bombed. But as far as the German-owned electrical companies, did they um, undergo a rather heavy bombing? I took a look at that. The Siemens plant, for example, uh, they were bombed. There's no question. But uh, the industry was not targeted as a general target. So Siemens, for example, was not bombed as heavily as, say, um, uh, tank plants or... Uh, aviation plants, that kind of thing. You mentioned the Ford plant in Cologne. Was yeah. this a prime military target? The Ford plant in Cologne should have been a prime military target. For example, the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, did bomb the Ford plant at Poissy in France. But the Ford plant in Cologne, which was the by far the largest Ford plant in Germany, was not bombed in World War II. But did our military planners intend to bomb it? In other words, was it on the aiming report? Well, uh, I did look at the aiming reports for the uh, plants in Cologne. Uh, Ford was known about. It, they knew that it was producing equipment for the Wehrmacht. Uh, but it was not bombed. It was scheduled as a target, but it was not bombed. So somewhere along the line, as far as the planning was concerned, the name of uh, the Ford Motor Plant in Cologne was deleted, and yet the city of Cologne itself was totally decimated. The city of Cologne was decimated, uh, as of course many other cities in Germany were decimated, but somewhere along the line, um, something happened. I suspect it was in the aiming committees, and Without question, orders were sent out not to bomb uh, certain targets, even though these were prime military targets. And that's rather reminiscent of some of the orders that went out during the Korean War, some of the orders that went out during the Vietnamese War to leave specific targets within the enemy's domain untouched by our strategic bombing. I understand that was so, although I had not investigated it. Now, in your book, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, there was one very interesting section about a special fund that Heinrich Himmler had and the funneling of money from German corporations into this fund even up into the years 1943 and 1944 and many of these corporations had strong ties into the American corporations, into their, the American parent corporations. Could you tell us a little bit about the Kepler Fund? The Kepler Fund was also known as the Conto S Fund. It was uh, what we might call Heinrich Kimmler's personal slush fund. He used it for his own personal projects. And um, what amazed me was both in 1933 and in 1944, the two days, uh, the, the two years for which I examined the records, um, over half the funds came from American corporations. For example, in 1933, ITT, uh, Standard Oil, General Electric, and uh, and possibly Osram were contributors. Even in 1944, in the middle of World War II, we find that ITT was funneling funds to Heinrich Himmler's, fu uh, Heinrich Himmler's fund through um, Schroeder, who was the chairman of the uh, ITT subsidiaries in Germany. We also find that uh, Depag, the um, standard oil subsidiary in uh, Germany, was financing Heinrich Himmler, and this was in the middle of World War II. Now, were these facts ever brought out at the Nuremberg hearings? They were never brought out at the Nuremberg hearings, although the documents do exist within the uh, within the files, within the records. They have not been published, as far as I know. And you actually had access to these records? Yes, there's some 400 tons of these records available. And uh, many of them were at the Hoover Institution, or copies were at the Hoover Institution, and that's why I found the original documentation. I think it's a tragic part of our history when the American public doesn't realize the interplay then between great American corporations and the financing, the funding of the Nazi movement. Now, 
I wanted to talk just a little bit about the Nuremberg trials. Because of the Nuremberg trials, the Nazis, the Nazi war criminals, the Nazi generals were, hold, were held specifically guilty for what transpired. Were there any Americans um, involved? Were any Americans um, indicted? Were any Americans convicted as far as the financing of the Nazi war movement? Uh, very definitely not. Uh, I looked at the criteria for um, what we might call war, war crimes under the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal. And there's no question in my mind that certain Americans well fitted the criteria which required indictment and trial. But no Americans were ever brought to trial. Do you think there was any conscious effort to conceal this fact, both from the Nuremberg War Tribunal and from the American public? Well, it was a conscious effort in the fact that uh, these businessmen were very... Uh, prominent in uh, stating in 1946 that they had no knowledge of what Hitler was doing and yet they were intimately involved with the build-up with Hitler. I suspect that this was not published in the media at the time, although I've not checked that. But certainly the, the role of American corporations and American businessmen in aiding Hitler has not been published. Now what about the actual financing? What about the loans from large American banks, from large British banks, to Hitler's government in that period between 1933 and 1939 when Hitler was preparing for war? Well, you've got to go back a little earlier and look at what are known as the uh, young loans, which were very important because I think they brought about the economic collapse of Germany in 1933. That was the young plan. But this was Owen Young, who was of course chairman of General Electric. Uh, here we've we got a man who actually made the loans as an officer of the United States government, which brought about the collapse of Germany in 1933, enabling Hitler to take over. And then subsequent to 1933, you get a series of loans. Um, uh, a very good one is Standard Oil, which um, loaned several million dollars, at least, to Germany to build up its um, aviation gasoline facilities. And uh, there are other examples. Fine. Well, I'd like to get a little bit into the background of the financing of Bolshevism because I think this is vitally important. And we can go back to the period after the uh, Second Revolution, which was in October and November of 1917. The initial financing of Lenin's movement, how did it tie into the American corporations? Was there any American involvement in that period between 1917 and 1918 when Bolshevism was just beginning to get a foothold in Russia? Yes, there were several uh, incidents. The most important is one involving Colonel uh, William Boyce Thompson, who was the largest shareholder in the Chase Bank, which of course today is Chase Manhattan Bank. And um, I published in one of my books a, uh, a copy of a cablegram which transferred funds from New York to Petrograd in December 1917, one million dollars to be precise. And uh, Colonel Thompson made the statement later that this one million dollars was given to the Bolsheviks uh, to, to consolidate, that they had just begun to take over Russia. They only controlled Moscow and Petrograd at that time to aid the, um, the control that the Bolsheviks were extending in Russia. This is a very clear case. One million dollars, American funds, transferred through an American Wall Street intermediary to the Bolsheviks. And didn't you publish that... Uh document here in Wall Street and the Rise of Bolshevism? I published two, uh, two statements. One is a copy of the cablegram and the other is a copy of the news clip of the statement made by Colonel Thompson at that time that he had given, made this contribution. Now why would an American capitalist, an American financier, help to aid Bolshevism? The only answer, and of course this puzzled me for years, you know, why? Why? Because we understand there to be an opposition. And the only answer I can come to is one of captive markets. The United States did not want another United States in the world. And of course, if you look at the world map, uh, Russia is uh, two or three times larger than the United States. Imagine this as another United States, as another competitor to the United States. What the United States wanted, or Wall Street wanted, was a captive market. And of course, socialism is a captive market because my earlier studies at Stanford University had brought out the fact that a socialist system cannot innovate. It's got to import innovation and technology from the West. And so I think the aim behind this was to encourage the development of Marxism and other, social, other types of socialism because this would give these Wall Street bankers control of a world market, a captive market.